hello Celeste and you were kind and brave enough to um, to say that you liked receiving these thank you uh, I like doing them and um, so here's the second uh, I hope there will be more uh, forgive my dopiness it's rather early on a blustery horrible morning here I'm not awake but I want to do these as a means of waking up if that's alright uh, there will be mistakes and uh, um, <laughs> irrelevant discursions into whatever is going on in my head at the moment which at the moment is not a lot um, I thought I'd make a change from what I did last time namely that this will be prose not poetry uh, I don't think I'm ready to tackle any poetry at the moment it needs a bit of, bit of preparation Rose needs preparation too, and I haven't prepared. So, <laughs> just roll the dice and see what happens. Um, this is, I think you are a very visual person. So this I thought would be appropriate. It's from a collection by my favourite art critic, and there's a lot of rubbish written about art. And this chap seems to cut to the the essence of what it's about. It's a fellow called David Sylvester. Um, and it's a compilation of his essays entitled About Modern Art, Critical Essays, 1948 to 1997. And here's one about probably my favourite of the slightly post-impressionist um, artists uh, Bonner who is um, colourful obviously and um, oh god it's too early I can't really come to terms with why I like Bonner I, I won't even try so I'll just read what he says and hope that it might interest you and uh, send you off in search of his genius. Um, right. He wrote this in 1966 and his note at the beginning of the essay is Bonnard, occasioned by a major Bonnard retrospective at the Royal Academy. This appeared in the Sunday Times magazine in nine, in, on the 6th of February 1966 under the unfortunate title A Nude About the House. The text has been slightly revised. A Nude by Bonnard is not an odalisque or a nymph or a goddess or a model, but a woman observed in the bedroom or in the bathroom, almost always self-absorbed, doing something to her body, or looking at herself, or brooding. Very occasionally she is looking towards the beholder, and then, more often, with an indifferent rather than a directed, provocative gaze. Generally her face is averted or turned away, and she has an air of being unaware, or choosing to ignore, that she is under observation. She is scarcely ever shown with someone in attendance, whether a maid or a mate. The rare exceptions include an early work, in which she is sitting up on a bed, next to which a naked man is standing holding a towel 
or a robe. And a late work, in which only her legs are visible, stretched out in the bath, and seen shooting up from the bottom of the canvas, while in the far corner are a part of the dressing gown and the front of a man walking into the picture, carrying a pallet. There are a few paintings in which a solitary nude woman is found out of doors, and a few, usually with mythological subjects, in which a couple or a group of nudes are seen among trees or by the sea. But in most of these, the nudes are part of the landscape, rather than nudes in a landscape. The outstanding exception is an almost Titianesque picture, painted in about 1903, of a fawn rudely embracing a nymph. For the most part, the nudes in landscapes are ingredients in making pictures. Excuse me are ingredients in making a picture, rather than bodies whose nudity seems to have involved Bonal's feelings or curiosity. His book illustrations involve several highly charged images of naked groups of girls and loving couples. As a painter, his obsession with the nude was concentrated on a solitary, private figure. In this exclusiveness, Bonnard is rare among the great painters of the nude. Most of them have done nudes in couples or in groups. Lovers, bathers, dancers, athletes, noble or ignoble savages, women in harems or brothels, or just models posing together. Bonnard's neglect of all these possibilities is in keeping with his work as a whole whether painting people, or still life, or landscape, he painted what was near to them. His surroundings, excuse me, I'm sorry, he painted what was near to him, his surroundings, and his intimates. He painted whatever belonged to his personal life, and he painted it the way he saw it in the ordinary course of events. One cannot imagine him arranging a still life on a table in order to make a picture of it. He would have painted the still life that happened to be there, rearranging it on the canvas perhaps, but not interfering with the actual things. Just as, in fact, he didn't cultivate his garden, but he let it grow as it would. There may well have been a connection between this passivity of his and his diffidence about painting from nature. He gave convincing reasons for preferring to paint from memory, helped by drawings. He felt in danger of being distracted by the effects of direct and immediate vision and losing the primary idea on the way. Yet his deepest motive could have been an unwillingness to freeze the flow of life. It was an attitude which, in his treatment of the nude, precluded his depicting her posed and returning his gaze. It demanded that she should not notice him. And then it precluded that will to organize and dominate which urged Cézanne and Renoir, Matisse and Picasso, to emulate the great figure compos compositions of tradition. And it precluded the quest for exotic models, for women set apart, that led Degas and Lautrec to find subjects in the brothels. The brazen sexiness of many of Bonnard's paintings and lithography of the late 1890s, clearly derived from the pleasures of a private and absorbing relationship. His involvement with Marie Boursin 
known as Marthe, whom he met in 1894 and who lived with him until her death in 1942. They got married in 1925. The majority of the nudes he painted were images of Marthe. She was constantly the same woman in a rather special sense as she got older. He went on painting her ex exactly almost the same as he had when she was younger. He views her with a complexity of feeling that has hardly been surpassed in art. There is idealization. The aged wife, excuse me, the aging wife dreaming in her bath is dissolved into his, his daydream of their youth. There are intimations of her mortality in the way in which her form is in process of disintegration in the light and the colours, which are the colours of overripe fruit or of flowers that have begun to die. There is compassion for her in her vulnerability. There is longing to possess her, a feverish and insatiable longing to merge with her, as closely as she herself, when lying on her bed, seems to melt into the sheet beneath her. And there is irony, a rueful wit that is sharply aware of her absurdity. The absurd look of a woman, for all that she is as golden as if she were perfectly naked, but for her high-heeled shoes, powdering herself. The absurd affinities between women and their pets, as in the painting of a girl lying on her front, in which the delectable undulations of the contour of her back are echoed in the contours of the little white dog lying by the bed, and again in the painting of a woman in the bath, in which a small brown dog lying on the bath mat is framed by the mat as its mistress is framed by her tub. And I think I'll leave it there. The essay does continue for another two pages. Um, I'm sorry, I really didn't know it was going to be quite as, um, I don't know, uh, explicit <laughs> as it was. I suppose when you're writing about nudes it's difficult not to be. Um, I have been so far this morning doing recordings uh, for people taken from my webcam. Um, and <laughs> And they don't look great, so be grateful that I have spared you that particular horror. Um, it wouldn't fit well with a, a descriptive piece about one of the greatest painters I know. Um, so I will... Well, if I was properly active, I would seek to illustrate this, or to edit this, with uh, the relevant stills from Bonnard's work. Um, but I'm not very good at that, and so I probably shan't. I'll just put one on the front and uh, leave it to you if you want to explore. Um, and I'm rambling. Oh, God. Okay, time to stop. Um, I know I had other things to say, but I can't remember what they were. Nope, that's it. Have fun. Bye-bye.